Welcome to today's webinar, How Purple Sleeps Better with Streamlined Document Control, Kappa, and Nonconformances, sponsored by ETQ. I'm Dirk Sharm, Editor-in-Chief for Quality Digest, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Many, organiza or many organizations start their quality process automation journey with document control to easily identify control and track all their documented processes and procedures in a centralized insert secure location. Then once the first application is adding value, then uh, a lot of organizations then expand their use of the QMS. Purple is growing rapidly in the hyper competitive mattress market by focusing on innovation and quality with significant results. This includes a number one rating in customer satisfaction by JD Power for two years in a row. Today, we will look at how Purple has automated quality processes. Uh, we're going to learn how, with one solution, they combine standard out of the box applications with highly configured ones to meet their unique needs. And in addition, we will see the quality and business benefits Purple achieved through automated document control, cap it, and nonconformances. We're going to look at some best practices and lessons learned in the Purple quality journey. And uh, we'll take a look at a lot more. Before we get started, uh, just a reminder that you can send questions to us using the Q&A box. You can find the Q&A button in the bar at the bottom of your screen. Just mouse down. You'll see that uh, menu bar pop up. Send your questions to us as you think of them, and we will answer them at the end. A recording of this webinar will be available one day after the webinar, so keep your eyes open for an email with that information from Quality Digest. Also very important, if you need a certificate of attendance for this webinar, you will need to answer a polling question that will be presented uh, during the webinar. Okay, let's get started. Today's presenters are Anna Cook, Quality Systems Manager at Purple, and David Isaacson, Senior Director of Product Marketing at ETQ. Anna is an experienced quality systems manager for Purple with previous experience as a quality manager for a company that manufactured and distributed aerospace parts. She enjoys helping people and finding solutions to problems that will help make people's jobs easier. She takes pride in improving processes and never settling for this is how we've always done it excuses. David has over 25 years experience in software product marketing and product management. Uh, David has successfully brought software as a service products to market for a variety of industries and high growth companies. He has worked for software companies so, such as uh, Anaqua, uh, VFA Ac Accruent, and Oracle, where he led the product management team responsible for integrating analytics into the Oracle database. And uh, David, I believe you are starting us off. That's correct. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone for joining us today on uh, this webinar. I'm really excited to be here today with Anna Cook. I think this is going to be really fascinating, and I think everybody's going to get a lot out of today's webinar. Uh, before we get into Purple's quality journal, journey, I do want to give a quick introduction on ETQ and set the stage a little bit for uh, where the, the applications that Anna's going to talk about actually fit within the ETQ product line. So we'll just briefly talk about that. Um, so first, let me give you a little bit of an overview of who ETQ is. Uh, we have, uh, we're a company that's been around for over 29 years, focused on quality. That is our, our brand, that is our, our products, that is what we do, that's what all 200 or so employees are focused on is delivering quality to our customers uh, through a very broad application portfolio. We have over 40 applications all in the cloud that give our customers a very unique, very flexible platform for meeting their quality needs. And as it shows there, it is an award-winning uh, application set that, that we brought to, that we brought to market. We are headquartered in Boston, uh, but we do support customers around the globe. We have uh, customers in over 14 different industries, uh, manufacturing such as Purple, um, as well as electronics and food and beverage, life sciences, uh, medical devices and pharmaceuticals, uh, and so forth. So, 
support a very broad range of customers. And we support those customers from very large organizations down to very small. So you'll see a very diverse set of, of customers taking advantage of ETQ's solutions, which brings a lot of value to our customers because we are able to cross-reference and use the best practices from lots of different industries and bring those to all of our customers. And what you'll hear from Anna, in fact, is it's not just ETQ that brings those best practices to the market, but customers share best practices with each other. So that's another huge value of being an ETQ customer. As I mentioned, uh, we are focused on quality. We believe that having a very flexible solution allows you to take advantage of what makes you special, what your uh, value props to the market are, and therefore leverage the ETQ product set to be better at doing that and to bring those quality products to market. Now, as I said, I wanna give you a little bit of context about what Anna will be talking about today when we talk about document control and corrective action and so forth. And this gives you a quick overview of the ETQ Reliance product line. There are a broad range of platform capabilities that infuse technology into all of the applications that run on the platform, whether you're looking to make sure that you've got an audit trail and traceability within the product, you're able to report, you're able to integrate with third-party products and so forth. All of that's part of the core of the application. Then there are a set of quality applications through a broad set of different application sets that allow you to tailor the system to exactly what you need to do and want to do when you want to do it. So when you look at the items on the left-hand side, those core applications, you know, what are key initial applications that most companies look at for uh, quality? You look at document control, you look at corrective action, uh, you start to expand when you look at things like uh, non-conformance handling and health and safety and life sciences, but put it all together, you have a complete integrated application set that allows you to meet your quality needs. This is all in the cloud, what we call cloud native, which means you get to take advantage of the power of all of the innovation that's taking place in the cloud today. And it's supported by a very powerful analytics capability. And as I said, today we'll look at document control, corrective action, and non-conformance handling, and that's where uh, Anna will, will take us through the purple journey. Document control, I think everybody understands what that is. You can store documents, you can create them, you can manage them, you can approve them, you make sure that all of your employees have access to them or those that should have access to them get the, that information when they need it. We look at corrective actions. Obviously, nobody wants to have a corrective action, but when you have to do it, you need to do it right. You don't want to be audited and then say, oops, I forgot about that. So having corrective actions and being able to track them through a standard process is really critical. And that allows you not only to track any individual corrective action, but notice what trends are occurring over time. So if you start to see the same kind of result or the same types of problems showing up in multiple corrective actions, that can give you a clue as to where you need to start to focus to help improve quality. And then finally, non-conformance handling. Now, there are a number of different applications within the non-conformance arena. We're gonna to focus today on non-conformance reporting, but there are other capabilities there as well. And as, you're up, as, as you grow, you can take advantage of, of all of those. So not just from that initial non-conformance, but looking at customer feedback and any expected deviations if you wanna do a temporary change in how something is, is made, and then even going through the return material authorization. So when you need to take back product from a customer. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Anna to take us on Purple's journey. Anna, over to you. All right. Um, I think you can go to the next slide and even just the next one. Um, uh, Dirk went over this one uh, earlier, so I'm okay giving this one. I think we'll talk more about my history and 
when we discuss some stuff. So a little bit, just a little bit about Purple that people um, might not know. We're a fairly um, new company. It all started um, in 1989. Uh, the founders, uh, two brothers, Tony and Terry, wanted to uh, make wheelchairs. Uh, they saw a need out there for um, high-tech carbon fire sporting goods and wheelchairs. And then quickly realized that um, as they were testing those wheelchairs that the real need was in better cushioning for those wheelchairs. So that really was the start of um, what we call the um, gel flex grid, which is the base of, of uh, the majority of the products that Purple sells. Um, it's uh, made out of hyperelastic polymer, which was discovered and licensed in the 90s to 2013. Um, in that time frame, um, and in 2013, they decided they wanted to make a mattress, and they invented what they call the Mattress Max machine, which um, from ground zero they invented to help make that um, the hype, uh, gel flex grid to put into the mattresses. They did a Kickstarter and raised um, over $100,000 within like five days, and that's um, in 2016, and that's kind of how Purple started. Um, to date, we um, are headquartered in Lehigh, Utah, and we have three manufacturing facilities, um, one in Alpine, Utah, Grantsville, Utah, and then the newest one is in McDonough, Georgia, so a little bit south of Atlanta, Georgia, and that just opened up um, this year. We started making mattresses out of that facility. So we are, uh, we're rapidly growing, and it's really exciting to be a part of, of Purple at this time. Um, next slide. David. Um, so the start of Purple and ETQ, like how do we, um, it was a little bit before my time, it was February. I've been at Purple, uh, this is a little background, since September of last year, so just a little bit over a year. So from what I understand from people who were here before me who started or started investigating um, the needs for a software like ETQ is we needed a place to store technical or technical documents that um, show or give requirements on how to make our product, like the suppliers. We wanted somewhere um, that had uh, revision control, um, uh, sign off and all of that uh, in a central repository and ETQ and the document control application in particular um, is what sold us on having ETQ. So February of last year, we started the implementation. Uh, it kind of got sidetracked a little bit because of obviously COVID and people being furloughed. But that only took like a couple months to figure out. And then we quickly got on back on track and completed uh, that initial implementation um, early summer of last year. So next slide, David. Um, so today, current state of ETQ at Purple is document control is the most used application throughout all the different departments um, at Purple. Um, we do uh, manage CAPAs at, soon after the document control module or application was implemented. We um, saw how great it was and decided that we would uh, take the out of the box Kappa and just deployed it and have been using it ever since. We haven't had to touch much of it because it's such a great um, application that ETQ designed that we haven't done much configuring to it. Um, it is out of the box and we just use it and have no issues with it. So it's, it's a really great application. Um, so then uh, last fall, uh, we discovered we needed a better method of tracking non-conformances. Um, we're getting product in from suppliers that we needed to decide what to do with it. It, was, it wasn't meeting um, uh, the requirements. And so we quickly uh, looked into the non-conforming application and decided it would fit our needs. And so I worked on customizing it and um, we rolled it out January of this year and have been using it ever since. 
and then Anna, uh, could you um, yeah. Anna, this is Jerry. Could you speak up just a little bit? Oh yeah, sorry. Maybe my headphones. Is that any better? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So then, yeah, we quickly customized it, and we are using the non-conforming performance application. And then just recently, we took um, engineering reached out and said they needed a place to store test records. So the, I took one of this, the blank applications and customized it. So engineering had a place to store test records. They took them off of someone's desktop who just had them and um, they store them in there. And it's been working great for that, um, for that also just as kind of a repository. We can go to the next slide. So kind of the future for ETQ and Purple, um, end of December, well, actually we started it this week. So slightly ahead of schedule, we started, uh, we implemented the training, training management module or application. We uh, created course profiles for all the work instructions that we have in ETQ and the procedures and rolled out some of those trainings just this week to people. So they can, we can start tracking training, competency, effectiveness of uh, training, making sure they know what they what they're doing. So that's been it's been exciting to to uh, start that. It's uh, it's been a long time coming and uh, needed, and so um, I'm excited to to start uh, really using that training management application. Then within six months, we have plans to implement the change management application. We're finding a need to have a robust like uh, ECR type process and so the change management application is going to be used and then um six to nine months we need to implement the ppap and deviation application so that's kind of um, our roadmap for 2022 and, and etq okay, the next slide so a few lessons learned the um, things that i've learned while uh working at purple and uh getting kind of thrown into etq is um Academy is your best friend. Um, when I st first started last September, I went through the Academy and did all the trainings to become an admin. And of course, if you, just like anything else, if you get the training and you don't use it, you kind of lose it. You lose it. Um, you lose the knowledge that you gained. Um, so to be able to go back to the Academy and kind of reference those trainings, because like you see something like that rings a bell. I know I saw a training on that. So to be able to go back to Academy and search and find the training to refresh your memory. And then also the, all the, the monthly um, webinars they put out, it's, they're awesome. I've learned so much. I don't have a software background and being able to find that information and then be able to uh, do things in ETQ myself is really helpful. And then also, um, Connecting with other ETQ customers in, in the, what they call the community is helpful. People will post questions. You just search and people will, you'll find that people have the same questions that you have. And the uh, ETQ, users, ETQ users that have been around longer answer those questions and they're really helpful. I've even had a couple that have, we've taken it out of the community and contacted me directly. And we've con and I've, they've been a huge help when I've tried to um, customize some applications and needed a little bit of help. Um, also, I always, the ones that the applications that we've started, they start out of the box. I think is a great place to start. Just the EPQ does a great job designing their applications, but they're a really great foundation for anything that you want to change. And the only things that um, we'd really change are. Um, some things that are unique to our business and our company. So starting out of the box is a great place to start. And I have found that um, it can always be changed a little bit later down the road and it doesn't really hurt anything. If you want additional fields added or you discover later on, I, oh, maybe in this point in time, I'd wanna track this information. Um, you go and add those fields to the, um, to the form and, it all, and it's okay to do that. Um, but then always a little bit of testing and training before rollout is always helpful. But people are always going to have questions because it's new. So, um, yeah, I think those are my big lessons, my big lessons learned that I've learned in the last year um, working at Purple and, and with ETQ. So I think the next slide.
Yeah, that, that's really very, very interesting. I appreciate that. And I'm starting to talk about that a little bit more. Um, I want to go back, you know, we, we kind of skipped over the, the bio slide, right, a little bit. And so I, can you just, I think it'd be great for everybody to understand if you could just tell us a little bit about your background, a, a little bit more in the journey and how you got to be a quality professional. I think, you know, we always focus in on product and, and results here, but a lot of times people also want to understand, you know, career paths and, and mm -hmm. what they might be able to accomplish on their own. And I think your story might be very interesting to others than that. Regard. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I don't think any, uh, no child grows up wanting to be a quality professional. They don't even know <laughs> what it is, right? I actually have a degree in psychology. Um, uh, my bachelor's in psychology. So it's just, it's, uh, it was a journey. Um, I worked at my previous employer for 15 years. I was an aerospace company um, in Utah. Um, I worked in various departments and I had learned a lot about the company working in those various departments. They had hired a new director of quality and he wanted a quality engineer that had, had worked at um, the company for a while and had a good knowledge of all of the systems that we used. Um, and had good relationships with various people in the departments. And because I had worked in, I've worked in, I worked in sales and purchasing and uh, product management, um, project management in various areas, I had those relationships and the knowledge of those systems. So he, I was recommended by one of his employees and he offered me a job and I just said, well, sure, let's try it out. Let's, let's see what, what's like working in quality. Um, and so my focus was on the QMS uh, at my previous employer and assisting with quality escapes, bad product that shipped out to our customers. So um, at that, that, my director who hired me was a great mentor and he taught me lots of uh, quality systems uh, stuff, um, sent me to various trainings to really learn about uh, quality, uh, ISO, all these different things. So he was, he was, uh, integral in my um, learning about quality and different systems. Um, and I think coming from that aerospace background has helped me understand regulations and what a robust um, QMS or business management system um, looks like and how it helps a company succeed. Um, a QMS or business management system isn't put in place to hinder specific departments, but it helps to make great product that will always meet customer expectations. I think that's what people need to remember. And are you having fun doing it now? Yes, I actually, I do enjoy my job and I find that quality was actually a really pretty good fit for my personality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. It took me a while to figure it out, but I do enjoy yeah. my job, yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh -huh. and, and I know you weren't, you weren't at Purple when the decision to move to a QMS was made, but could you share a little bit about what you know about why that decision was made? You know, not necessarily the decision to go to ETQ, but just in general, why, you know, a QMS was something that, that Purple felt was important. And then maybe yeah. even talk about some of the benefits that you guys have seen. Yes. It all started with um, yeah, needing a place to store those technical documents. Um, if they were um, being created and put in people's personal desktops and uh, SharePoint folders. So they decided they needed a place um, to house those, those product definitions um, to be able for everyone to easily access them. Everyone gets access to ETQ first day that they get hired. So everyone can access those documents. We need a revision control. We need to be able to archive the old versions so people were accidentally sending them out to suppliers. And then we needed stakeholder review and approval um, so that everyone is buying off on those product definitions. So that's, so that's why ETQ was chosen um, for, for, to, for particular for those, for those functions. Um, and it's, it's, it, works, it works great. One who uses it really has no issues with the software and likes it, so. That's great. Yeah. And and now that, that you've got a QMS, and it obviously, when you started this whole journey or when Purple started this journey, quality started to become something that 
people thought about all of a sudden. Um, where does quality sit from an organizational perspective today and its importance to Purple? So it is, it's important. Uh, quality sits under like um, operations. And quality is vital, and we are, we, we're in a very competitive market. Um, so not only is innovation important to our product, but also quality. If we don't produce a quality product, no one's going to buy our products. If we don't um, have consistency in that product, we're not going to have repeat customers. So part of all of that is having a good QMS to be able to have documented processes to provide that consistent quality product. Okay, and then, I mean, you spent most of the time talking about doc control, so I want to focus there for a moment as well. Okay. Um, in terms of, you know, you started with out of the box and then started to do some configurations. Mm -hmm. How did you uh, think about that? How did you go through the process of saying, okay, now that we understand what out of the box looks like, how do we want to change it? Um, some of it was people's suggestions that started using it too, because as you have more users using the software, they'll come up, they all have other, they all had companies they worked for before. Everyone has a background, right? So they would come at, hey, at this place I used to work, we had this, and it was really great that we could have this certain function. And so we did that. We've implemented some of those changes to our applications. Um, specifically for document control, we found a need um, a lot of our documents that we create are really big and they won't go through email. So um, we have, we figure, configure document control and a few other things. So suppliers can have access to ECQ and it has been fantastic. We set them up, we give them their uh, credentials to log in and we assign the documents that they can just see and uh, they can go in real time, basically real time without, relying on someone else to email them the document they need and get access to anything they need to be able to build our product, see our requirements. So I think for document control, that has been one of the biggest um, configurations that we've done is to allow suppliers to have access. Oh, nice. And, mm -hmm. and, and those changes, did you make them? Did you have to get somebody with a programming background to make them? How did that work? So, so, I did the majority of them, and I have utilized um, remote consulting at ETQ for times that I didn't, I couldn't figure it out. Okay, so a combination of both. A combination, yes. I have learned a lot mm -hmm. within the last year and how to program a little bit of software, but there's still stuff that's above my head, so I, I utilize ETQ when I need to. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. And then, um, Couple other questions here that just yeah. things I want to just cover here. First of all, in terms of you know, docking control and even moving beyond that to some of the other applications, CAPAs and so forth. Yeah. What would you say um, for to the attendees here? Here, I know you talked a little bit about um, lessons learned, but what would you, what recommendations or what advice would you give for those looking to automate document control, automate corrective actions, and so forth? That you'll. Um to just do it. it, being on paper is the worst, right? So just in this day and age, with everyone who works remotely or um, technology, you need to have that technology to be able to do things so people can work remote. Um, and you can't rely on people checking their emails. You need to have a software that uh, people can log into and see what their assignments are or see what they have in their queue to watch for. You can't make uh, sending a document through an email because there's be so many different emails. You can't rely on people knowing which the latest email is to search for a document. So having a software system is, I think, vital in, in this day and age. Okay. Um, and then are you, you know, you got the doc documents and document control. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about moving to training management. Are you looking to train people on the documents that are in there and then track that when you talk about, you know, making yes. sure that they've done their assignments, things like that? Yeah, that was the biggest goal or one of the biggest reasons we wanted to implement that training management module. It did take us a year before we discovered, well, I knew we needed it about six months ago. And then I thought we need to be able to 
without um, a supervisor writing it on a piece of paper track, who's been trained on these work instructions, who's been trained on these procedures, right? So that was the big push on getting that training management module up and running. So okay. we could have that history of who's been trained on what and um, was, it, was it effective? Are they, are they being able to do their job? Do we have confidence that they know what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And then in terms of uh, the value you've seen so far, you know, how would you, how do you, how do you talk about that? How do you think about, you know, in terms of, I don't know if, if, if it's, you know, I don't know, we, we talked a little bit about ROI, but more in terms of just streamlining operations, saving time, what, where have you seen the biggest returns in that regard? So I feel the biggest, um, in the biggest area has been when we implemented that non-conformance module. Okay. So back last year before, yeah, last year we were doing non-conformances on a piece of paper. So you had an inspector mm -hmm. typing it in a Word document, what the non-conformance was, writing it out time after time, all the same information. It would get sent to um, our administrator and he would send it out for signature via email. And it was just taking a long time to get the, that product moved through the system to get everyone's buy off. So we decided we need to implement that non-conformance module. So we took that out of box, customized it a little bit. And the biggest thing, we're just adding a couple fields that we felt down the road, we'd want to have some historical information for product trends, um, stuff like that. It was really, it was pretty minor the customization of the actual uh, application that we did, but it has, we can get a product moved through quality within hours if we need to have it on the production floor that afternoon. So that has been one of the biggest um, streamlines that we've done. Another um, has been really, it's taken the guesswork out of non-conformances is we streamlined how the routing works. So if anyone knows anything about ETQ, you have phases and you can assign certain people certain phases so we programmed it that they don't have any options of who gets sent certain phases that just goes to that same person for that dis that specific disposition it took the guesswork out of it for people they just have to hit a button and not be like well who do i send this one to so that's been really helpful for people um to just for uh the ease of sending them on for signature and approval right great um so we've we have a lot of people around this call right now, and then we've started to get a, a, a few questions in, and we appreciate that. You know, remind, remind everybody to use the Q and A button on the Zoom toolbar. Uh, before we get to questions, uh, Dirk, we can put up the poll question. Yeah, let's put up the poll question. And actually, um, at the same time I do this, I, I, I've got a question for Anna here, and everybody will just uh, respond to that poll question there. Um, so you're obviously retail firm, um, how do you get uh, voice of the customer feedback, whether it's complaints or, or, or positive feedback back into your QMS? Now I'm thinking not only from end, end users, the people who actually lay down in your mattresses, but maybe even your, your brick and mortar stores, things going on in the stores or, or your third party distributors, you know, mattress firms. How does that work its way back into uh, what you do? So they, um we don't particularly use ETQ for that, for that process of that feedback. We have a different software that our customer service uses, but there's all sort, they can call customer service. They can put out things on our website, the feedback, if they have feedback. Um, and that gets fed back into, um, I think it, it's just customer service and then quality and customer service work together to uh, analyze that data to determine, um, trends and uh if we have an issue with a mattress uh, we need to figure it out right so okay. we work closely with customer service in that area oh, great yeah thank you um so let's see it looks like uh, most people have kind of answered the question there so i'm going to go ahead and end the poll and i will share the results uh with everybody there it's pretty even look at that look at that so um Appreciate everybody participating, but it looks like uh, the the pain is spread across all these different areas. I don't know. Um, does that kind of mirror what you've seen, Anna, in terms of where the different pain points are within Purple? 
Yeah, for sure. And I think um, that's why we implemented the ones that we implemented and we're working on change management next. We kind of mm -hmm. decided that document control was obvious and then Kappa would have been easy to um, take out of the box and, and automate. And then uh, it kind of does go like that yeah, non-conformances and then training. And we have found a huge um, pain point in change management. So that's why we're doing it next. Mm -hmm. nope. All right, thank you everybody for answering the poll. Um, I will go to uh, the questions. We've gotten a bunch of questions in now. And the first one is from Art and he wanted to know how you're driving adoption of uh, the, the QMS. Yeah, so it's, it's little by little um, as so it's, it's there's kind of two ways as as purple grows and various departments have needs they will reach out or I'll be involved in discussions and we'll try to determine together if ETQ has a solution for them if they have an application that um, will work to help um, with a pain point that they're having that's kind of how I talked about that application for the records for engineering started they um, we were had a, just a, it was pretty casual conversation. They have all these records on someone's desktop or scattered spots in SharePoint. And I said, I can, I can customize something for you in ETQ. They can just all be housed there. Um, we can categorize them a certain way. You can. We have all these different options, the types, categories, and so um, I took a real pain point for them, and it didn't take me. It took me a couple hours, really. It wasn't a hard customization to do. And now they're, they're, it's, um, they're loving it. So it was really something for easy, for, easy for me that made a huge impact on, on their department. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, and then a question from Kirk, and uh, he wants to know, is, is Purple ISO 9001 certified? We are not. We are driving. It's hopefully um, in the future soon. Okay. That, would be, that would be my preference, but no, we're not at the moment. Okay. Um, and then there's a question here from, I apologize for, for the person's name, Anidi, um, and I'm interpreting a little bit what, what they're asking, but has the QMS helped given the current pandemic situation now with the Delta variant and, and everything that's going on? Um, I don't know that we have seen a huge, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, because of COVID, we haven't really seen that. We've, I mean, we've seen a lack of being able to get a product just like every other company out there, right? Because of COVID and, but I, I think having the software has helped just because people can work remotely and they don't have to be in the office to be able to sign off things. So that might be one of um, the great things about having it. So people can sign off and approve things without an actual signature. It's just all in the software. So, okay. Maybe hopefully that answered the question. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Casimir had asked, "How do you ensure operators review instructions before performing their job?" Um. That is probably a really great question. I don't know that I know the answer. We, ha um, we have training or we have training plans for like say our inspectors and they have to complete all of the trainings before they're allowed access to be able to inspect product or write up product. So that's a way that we ensure that they have um, been trained and we have the tests. We have tests in each training. So they have to pass the tests in the training management module. So that's a way to ensure that they know that they know what they're doing before we kind of turn over the keys to them, so. Okay, and, and that also, uh, there was another question I, as I scrolled through here from Susanna that basically was the same, uh, making sure that employee was trained uh, on the training management application first. Yeah, so yeah, day one, they get all these different, the trainings assigned to them. And before they okay. are allowed to do any other, any work on the line or any work um, inspecting product, they have to complete all of the trainings, which probably would take a couple, uh, a couple of days. We don't have, the tests aren't super hard and we don't, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's the first thing they have to do. Okay. And in your workflow, real simple question here from Justin. Um, what do you do if the approver's out on vacation? How do you handle that? 
Uh, we uh, we try to get people to set up that uh, delegation module or applications. So they can delegate things to their coworker or a quality manager can delegate to their quality engineer. But yeah, using that delegation application is key when people are out on vacation so things don't get stalled out. Okay. Um, do you, from Steve, do you do any sort of statistical analysis to look for trends? I personally don't. There are departments like supplier quality uh, co-workers that do, and they'll pull information from ETQ. We also um, work on connection profiles to pull some of the data direct into what our ODBC snowflake that we use. So there are do other employees, my peers that do that analysis. I, I, I'm not in charge of that, so. Okay. And you just mentioned supply suppliers and, and supply mm -hmm. chain. Do you have plans to uh, expand into supply chain with ETQ at some point in the future? That, that Justin wanted to know if you did anything with supply chain. So we uh, keep a list of suppliers in ETQ and we uh, like their, their approval and uh, the different uh, locations that they have. Um, we give certain suppliers the access to document control. We want to start um, using the PPAP module and deviation application to go down that route also to be able to track those. So yes, okay. there are plans to enhance that side of it a little bit more next year. Okay, great. And um, Alia, Alia uh, wanted to know if you store any changes. So if you go in and make a change to a document, do you store that with the document so you can track historical uh, changes to what you've done? So, um... Yes, I guess we have a revision history in ETQ in the document control. So there's every time it's changed, people have to put in what, what was changed from the old document to the new document. And then there's a, the archive application. So all archived uh, documents are in there. So I can go back to, a, if we're on Rev E, I can go back to A, B, C, and D and look at exactly what was changed if I need to. So there is that option. Okay, great. And uh, I'm going to ask the follow-on question. In terms of reviewing documents, how does that workflow work with Purple? Uh, so anyone can originate a document. Well, okay, it's so not anyone. We do have, a, uh, most people can uh, originate a document and then we assign usually the process owner or department head as the owner of the document. And then there's reviewers and it's usually um, cross-functional list of reviewers of that whoever touches that document if it's a document that purchasing needs to buy off on we make sure that someone in purchasing the manager or a, a lead buyer is signs off on that document so they know it's out there so that's something that me and my team um we make sure that the reviewer list is pretty uh robust so that everyone knows that that document is out there and they sign off on it and give their okay all right great um, I'm going to take the next one uh, from Holly. She wanted to know if ETQ was 21 CFR Part 11 compliant, which is for life science compliance, and we definitely are. So the answer, Holly, is yes. Um, and then I got one here from Ross. Uh, we may have touched on this a little bit, but what is your best advice on getting buy-in from team members for the entirety of the QMS, especially when bringing about changes? Sometimes it's hard. <laughs> People don't <laughs> like change. You gotta have someone, uh, you just, uh, it's a little bit of politicking. <laughs> you have to be, and then they just or show them the benefits, the way that they can, it can benefit their job and make their job easier, I found has been the best way for people to take on change and to accept change. If I can show you that what I'm gonna propose to you is gonna make your job easier, then it seems like a pretty no-brainer, a good no-brainer that uh, they're gonna be okay with the change. Sometimes it is difficult. We've had some challenges, certain departments not wanting to make change, but we're getting there. Okay, and I've got two questions here on document control. First one from Steve. Um, are controlled documents such as work instructions available for viewing to untrained personnel? And if so, how do you control them from using it without signing off on it? It's really a question about how to get the new document version up and running when all users are not signed off on it. So yeah, um, 
you can hide you there are uh things in etq you can do so that only certain people have access to certain documents yeah um but most for the most part all employees have access to work instructions so i could anyone could come in and see all of the documents that quality uses to be able to inspect product i would say that um but your company wouldn't have to do that. You could uh, limit those to people who are actually trained. So ETQ has those things, um, options available when you're customizing it to be able to uh, narrow, uh, narrow that down. Okay. Um, I would guess it, it would make sense that you'd want that information as broadly known as possible. I would think so, I, in my opinion. And then you can have, if, they're doing writing a non-conformance and they've not been trained, you can give take away their access to be able to do that in ETQ, right? I control what access levels they have so that we only have trained people doing the things that they are supposed to be doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the other document control question or document question from Cindy is how do you handle your documents? Are they an attachment? um or in the document body also when you need to print the document how do you go about that so they're um in the document body there everything is a, as a pdf and we just have it in our um top level procedure that anything printed is a, a uncontrolled copy so people know if it's printed it's not controlled and that they um, but we do allow printing i think sometimes it's needed mm -hmm. some documents it's needed to print it we're just they're just uncontrolled and ATQ has an option that you can put um, a watermark on the document if you wish to do that that says like uncontrolled or if printed uncontrolled something like that there's that option out there okay um, I will say to Greg that we will follow up with you on answering your question um, and that's all we have at the moment um, so at this point I know we're we're about 45 minutes in, and I think that's that's great. We've, we've really covered a lot of ground here, and I would like to thank you for, for taking the time today to join us on this webinar. And You're welcome. Yeah, and I'll turn it back to Dirk. Hey, thanks. Uh, but David, actually, I got a question. I, I'm, I'm assuming this is probably more for you. It's a question that normally comes up, and I didn't see it come up this time, but I think it's worth discussing a little bit, is just uh, security. Uh, with more and more people working from home and working remotely, um, you know, sensitive information, obviously, um, that's being shared on the ETQ uh, servers. Just, just kind of inform us a little bit how the security works for, for ETQ. So we, we operate um, in the cloud, as, as you know, and we are, uh, we're hosted in AWS, Amazon Web Services. So we leverage their security. Um, we have a lot of, you know, what you'd expect um, from the security technologies built into the software and built into the environment. And beyond that, we then have security on uh, individual access, whether that's uh, an individual, uh, whether that is by role or even by location. So if you're in a particular location, you may only see documents that are pertinent to that, pertinent to that location, even if you uh, have broader access in general. So we try to control access from outside in. So you don't even get to the system if you're not allowed to be there. And then even when you're in, you only get to see what you're allowed to see. And and it really is context sensitive, so only you're allowed to see what you're what you're supposed to see when you're supposed to see it. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks for answering that. Um, sure. So, uh, Anna and uh, David, um, yeah, that is the end of our questions here for now. Um, if we didn't get to, uh, if some questions come in after after we close this down, don't worry, I will forward those on to uh, to the folks at uh, ETQ or to Anna over there at Purple. So, uh, thanks, guys, for the presentation today. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks to all of you as well for joining us today. Uh, you will be receiving an email with a link to a recording of this webinar from Quality Digest. Uh, keep your eyes open for that email. Uh, you may also be getting some uh, further information from the ETQ as well. So uh, just keep your eyes open for, uh, for all that. So from all of us here at Quality Digest and ETQ, have a great day. And we will see you at the next webinar. So long. Thank you.